Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. Got a great short study here for you in relationship to uh, uh, combining Judges 7 and Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 10 in relationship to the return of Jesus at the end of the age. And this short study on those three chapters are going to show you how Gideon, the least of a flock, represents Jesus attacking the Antichrist at the end of the age. And I'm going to prove that to you. And in doing this short study this morning, uh, you know, I had to just stop, like I do often, and I just had to lift my hands in the air, and I'm being very sincere. When I started seeing all these numerical matches, um, it happens often when you study the Word of God, and it really happened this morning. And just thank you, Father, for your Spirit, pointing all of these verses out, bringing them to memory, to uh, to remembrance. Hallelujah. But um, before we even get started in how you're supposed to teach the passages in Judges 7 about Gideon, and leading his small army against uh, Oreb and the Midianites, and how we're told in Isaiah uh, that when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back just like uh, the battle of Gideon versus, you know, in the day of Midian, like the slaughter of, of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And, and Isaiah is pointing you back to Judges 7. So before we even get into this short study, which you're going to be amazed at, at, at all of the matches, numerical and, and scripture matches, and how you can start putting it all together. But before we even do that, I wanted to just point something out to you all in Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66, the last chapter of the entire book of Isaiah, tells us about what the people are going to be like that the Lord is going to immortalize and, and grant eternal life. Those people whose names are going to be found in the Lamb's book of life when Jesus comes at the seventh bowl. And I wanted to point this out to you, and it won't be a surprise to, to you who study the Word of God uh, pretty much daily, uh, but for Christians and members of the church who only put one or two hours per month into the Word of God, it's going to strike a little fear in them. But I, I'm doing this to... to give you understanding of the type of person that Jesus is going to want to look upon for eternity. Eternity is a long time that God, that Jesus, the Son of God, has to look upon us. And he wants to make sure that the only people who live for eternity as the family members of Yah, the Holy One of Israel, um, that they're the type of person who trembles at the Word of God. And it doesn't mean that the Word of God should just always invoke fear, but it means that you understand the importance of the Word of God, the power of the Word of God, the importance, and you should honor it, and you should read it every day. <coughs> Excuse me. But... Uh, you'll see what I mean. Let's let's read the first six or seven verses of Isaiah 66. Thus saith the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me, and where is the place of my rest? What is this chapter about? Well, when you read the whole chapter, you realize it's talking about the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the age. And the start to the millennium, and the building of the fourth temple where Jesus will reside in the midst of his people during the millennium. But you also see the battle of the great day of God Almighty mentioned in this chapter. And uh, uh, But yeah, let's continue on with the first six or seven verses, because I want you to see 
the two times that the Word of God is telling us what is the type of person, what is a characteristic of the type of person who Jesus will know at his coming and want to look upon for hundreds of trillions of years. Here we go. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. Here you, here you go, brothers and sisters. Here's Almighty God telling you, <coughs> this is the person that my son is going to say, I know this one, and he'll introduce you, these individuals, to Father on the day of the wedding at the seventh bowl. I know this one, Father. This one is mine. All right, here we go. And where is, uh, for all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one, he's getting ready to tell you who, will I look? On him who is poor and a contrite spirit, Okay, keep reading, and who trembles at my word. You may think I'm making a big deal about a little thing, but this is, this is important. Tremble doesn't mean you just stay in fear when you're reading the word of God. Just the opposite. I can read passages in the Bible over and over and over about million, hundreds of millions of people dying a terrible death but I still have joy when I'm reading it. And you may think, well, yeah, we noticed <laughs> there's something wrong with you, brother. But because I know that anytime understanding of the word God, a word of God comes to you, it's a gift. The God of the universe is visiting you that day and he's handing you a gift. And that's a precious thing. And, and so you, you're not concentrating on the terrible deaths that you're reading about, but you are in joy because you and the Holy Spirit are in the garden and you're being taught by the word of God. You're being taught by the Holy Spirit things that shall take place and you're in joy. But this is the type of person who Jesus is going to say he knows and he's going to you will join him in the clouds. On the day of Christ, on the day of his appearing, right after the seventh angel pours the seventh bowl on the last day of the age. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Don't, don't say you tremble at the word of God if you only read it two hours a month or maybe 20 minutes a month. And don't say you tremble at the word of God. If you have someone or something send you a single Bible verse a day and you read it while you're drinking your coffee in the morning and you go, ah, that felt good. I spent time in the word today. No, you didn't, brothers and sisters. I'm sorry. You're lying to yourself. All right. I hate to see people uh, promote the verse of the day. I hate that. That's as evil as someone publishing the New Testament by itself. Both of them are evil. You got to understand that. Don't promote. Don't teach young Christians that it's okay <coughs> to read a verse a day. You need to be reading at a minimum a chapter a day. And if you don't understand it, you better keep reading till you do. People who tremble at the word of God are the ones who, who know that it predicts the future. It, 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 it not predicts, it tells you in advance what's going to happen. Who's going to be uh, granted eternal life? Who's going to spend eternity in hell? <coughs> and you're not going to stop reading until you understand what's in the word of God. Let's keep reading, because he mentions it again in this passage. He who kills a bull as if he slays a man, he who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck, he who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood, 
<coughs> excuse me, you can tell I've got the crud. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol, just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions. Now, brothers and sisters, you may say, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about the righteous. Well, we were in the first two verses. In verse 3, the Lord is showing us a contrast of the righteous. Now he starts talking about the wicked. Okay, you got to catch that. And their soul delights in their abominations. So will I choose their delusions. Is that talking about the uh, strong delusion of the 42 months? Yes. Who's going to uh, receive? Who's going to be confused? Who's going to bow before the image of the false Messiah and take the mark of the beast? Who, during the 42 months of strong delusion, those who don't tremble at the word, do you see the power of the word of God? The power of the word of God is going to tell you who is the true Messiah. If you're not reading the New Testament along with the Old Testament, you're not going to know who is the true Messiah. Okay? So I will choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. So this is Father talking about the nation of Israel over the last, you know, three or four thousand years. Father has a great memory, just like the present day people of Israel. They're acting just like their forefathers. Okay, and I'm not... Um, mentioning this, wanting you to believe that Gentiles act so much better than, than the nation of Israel. No, we act just like them. Okay. Now watch this, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake. This is talking about not only the prophets, of old being scorned and cast out of the city because they kept giving warning about a, a pending um, chastisement of the Lord. But this really is, since we, if you read the whole chapter, Isaiah 66, you, re, you see the subject. <coughs> it's the end of the age return of Jesus Christ. When God judges his nation first, then he judges the uh the nations of the world after that. But hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word, your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. Okay, so that's twice in the first five verses that uh, the word of God in Isaiah 66 is talking about who's going to be granted eternal life. Those who tremble at the word of God, my word, which is the New Testament and the Old Testament. They will not be confused during the 42 months of strong delusion. Okay, I'm spending a lot of time on this. I need to get to our short study today. <laughs> but, um, but I really wanted to focus in, because this is important. I mean, he's telling you, but on this one will I look. That's, that's the match to the passages in the New Testament talking about, I never knew you, but some he will know. And a lot of Christians are going to be like, how in the world can you not include me in the number? They're going to be looking up at us in the clouds with Jesus. Jesus, I did X, Y, and Z for you, right? Members of the church, but he, but they, but they're members of the church who don't tremble at the word of God. Again, don't read it twenty minutes a month, and tell me you tremble at the word of God. You know, it's just like a father and children. You know, father may have many children. There's going to be some that tremble at, at his instructions 
and there's going to be other children who uh, blow it off <coughs> and don't take it seriously. Hallelujah. All right. Let's get to the short study of Gideon and how it relates to the coming of Jesus Christ and G the rising of Jesus at the end of the age to fight the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That is like in the day of Midian. So let's read what I've got here from the top. Judges 7, Isaiah 9 and 10, as in the day of Midian. And if you don't know uh, the book of Judges and you don't know the story of Gideon, you need to read Judges chapter 6 and 7. And, you, and the reason why you must do that soon is because of what the, uh, the Word of God says about the return of Jesus at the end of the age in Isaiah 9 and Isaiah chapter 10. And he points you to information in Judges 7. And when you tremble at this short study, not my words, but those of the Word of God, you realize you are told who the final Antichrist is. Did you catch what I just said? Now, I don't mean the exact individual, but he is actually called an Assyrian. And that's real, a real important clue. And here we go. Like the slaughter of Midian at the Rock of Oreb. And like a lot of Christians... People will read that and go, what in the world is that talking about? Like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. It's real important that you read those stories and you understand it and its relationship to the end of the age. This is how the future Antichrist called the Assyrian and his kingdom will be destroyed. Let's start with a simple 70th week timeline to help us understand the order of events. Gideon, the least of the flock, represents how God the Father will use his son Jesus on the last day of this age of Satan. You see the timeline I have here for you? The last 2300 days of this age, according to Daniel 8 verses 23 through 25, this is a 2300 day countdown from the first seal to the seventh bowl, appearing of Jesus. You have the uh, Assyrian arising to power. Israel signs the covenant with death with its evil neighbors and surrounding peoples. Daniel 11, 23 and Isaiah 28, verses 15 through 18. You have the fifth seal, abomination of desolation. Obviously, I'm not listing every single seal, trumpet, or bowl in this simple timeline. You have the sixth seal, start to the day of the Lord. God scourge against his people. We have, uh, and that's found in Isaiah 28. Then at the seventh trumpet, we have that verdict of Daniel 7, verses 25 through 27. The proclamations of the three angels. Uh, Isaiah 10 is all about the scourge. God's scourge was against his people. That's Isaiah 28. Now the scourge mentioned in Isaiah 10 is the scourge against the Assyrian and his kingdom, the final Antichrist. Judges 7, Judges 7's messengers go out to the latter-day people who are present, who represent the mountains of Ephraim. Judges 7's messengers go out to the latter-day people who represent the mountains of Ephraim. God's scourge against the Assyrian, the final Antichrist, begins as in the manner of Egypt. And when you read all of these chapters that I have for you, you're going to see why I input comments like this, as in the manner of Egypt. Here come the good invited guests. We're talking about the bowls of wrath. Here come the good invited guests of Matthew 22.10. They are the My Mighty Ones of Isaiah 13.3, the Four Craftsmen of Zechariah 1.20, and the assembly of great nations from the north of Jeremiah 50, verse 9, Zephaniah 3, verse 8, Micah 5, verses 5 and 6, and Revelation 17, verse 16. And on the subject of the final Antichrist being called the Assyrian in the word of God, 
In other words, not talking about King Sennacherib from uh, many centuries ago. We're talking about the Assyrian as, as a title used by the Word of God to represent the final Antichrist. And you see that in Micah 5, verses 5 and 6, and you see it down here in Isaiah 14, verses 24 and 25. Now, on the subject of the good and bad invited guest of Matthew 22, if you don't know that story of the wedding, uh, the last day's wedding of Jesus Christ found in Matthew 22, you need to go read it. Here come the bad invited guests who are the people of the East from Revelation 16, verse 12. In other words, the assembling of the nations to the mountains of Israel and Jerusalem. All right, the seventh bowl, day of Christ. The day of Christ is the climax of the entire day of the Lord. Judges 7, killing of Oreb on the day of Midian, which is also called the day of battle. This represents the day of the battle, the great day of God Almighty at the end of the age when Jesus appears. The battle of the great day of God Almighty begins at the seventh bowl against the Assyrian's kingdom. Jesus leads his army of the My Sanctified Ones. He commands his My Sanctified Ones and he calls for, back here, his My Mighty Ones. And when they arrive, then it's time to unleash all of the weapons of his indignation against the Assyrian's kingdom. Uh, take notice that Zechariah 14.3 is Revelation 16, verse 14. And it's interesting how um, Zechariah 14 uh, gives understanding of the battle of the great day of God Almighty in Revelation. And then after the battle of the great day of God Almighty, you need to realize that Isaiah 11, 11 says that begins uh, the gathering together of the remnant of the seed line of Jacob from all seven continents. Those who are mark free. If they're not mark free, in other words, you can think of them as foolish virgins. If they're not mark free, uh, they're going to die back here. All right, here we go. Some verses for you that help you relate and see how Gideon's story of Judges 6 and 7, especially Judges chapter 7, relates, represents to how God the Father will use his son Jesus on the last day of this age of Satan. Look at all the numerical matches. Uh, I don't look, I don't, I don't make these numerical matches happen. I put together verses that, that talk about a particular subject. And then I go back and take another glance and go, oh my Lord, look at all of those. And then I point them out to you. And that's what I'm doing. Isaiah 9 verses 2 through 4. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Does that have anything to do with the appearing of Jesus Christ? Let's keep reading. Oh, the people who walked in darkness, does that have anything to do with the future time of Jacob's trouble, which will last for about 27, 28 months? Let's keep reading. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Why is this all past tense? Because it's things that are going to be spoken of in the early days of the millennium concerning the appearing of Jesus and the final battle of good and evil. That's why it's past tense, not because it's happened already. For those who dwelled in the land of the shadow of death, this is this coming 9-1-1 curse of Daniel 9 verse 11 that's going to come upon Israel in the second half of the 70th week of Daniel. I don't wish it on them. Father <coughs> says he's going to do it in Isaiah chapter 1 and the Song of Moses. For you have broken the yoke of his burden. This is now the God. It's going to be said of God and his son, his Christ Jesus. All right, they are one. For you have broken the yoke of his burden. In other words, the Redeemer is going to come and, re and redeem them from slavery. And the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. All right, as in the day of Midian. It's real important that you catch that. It's real important that you understand that Isaiah 9 
like the whole book of Isaiah, is talking about the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. And it's talking about the battle of the great day of God Almighty. All right, when their Redeemer finally comes. After the time of Jacob's trouble. But it's real important in Isaiah 9 once that you come to that understanding that you realize, hey, that's a clue. Jesus is coming back to break the Antichrist as in the day of Midian. And you're supposed to stop and go, that sounds Old Testament, but I don't remember what happened in the famous day of Midian in Israel's history. You're supposed to stop and go, well, I'm go I tremble at the word of God. I'm not going to stop until I find this in the word. And you also have to remember, brothers and sisters, from the last 2,000 years, last 1,500 years, right? It wasn't until lately that people can use search engines to help them easily find information like this. All right? Imagine the old days when you just had the Word of God, probably in, in, in print so small you couldn't even see it, and you had to go search all of the chapters of the entire Bible looking for the day of Midian? Do you see the difference in why the understanding of the Word of God is more readily available now than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 300 years ago? Right? We've got 10, 7, 10 Bibles in every household collecting dust. We've got Bible apps on our computer. And all of these search engines are at our fingertips. How dare we not tremble at the word of God? He just told you that Jesus, it'll be said in the early days of the millennium, that Jesus came and fought the Antichrist as in the day of Midian. And how can you read that and not even take the time to go find out what it means? How is Jesus going to fight? All right. The final Antichrist. Well, let's keep reading. Well, that's uh, Isaiah 9, verse 3. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. What is that talking about? Well, there's so many verses in the Bible that talk about um, the Antichrist being a plunderer of Israel and it's some of its neighbors like Egypt and Damascus and, and how Jesus, when he comes to defeat the Antichrist, Jesus is going to lead his people in plundering the beast kingdom. Do you know what the word plundering means? Like divide the spoil as in battle, okay? For you have broken the yoke of his burden. In other words, freed the Israeli slaves and the rod of his oppressor. Okay. Isaiah 10 verses 24 through 26. The very next chapter. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. Talking about great slavery for yet a very little while and the indignation will cease as will my anger in their destruction All right hide yourself for a little while these foolish virgins have to be hid in Bethany says Zechariah 14 Isaiah 16 says some of the foolish virgins are going to hide at the fords of the Arnon in other words uh Israelis, seed line of Jacob people who are mark free but don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. They must be hidden under the shadow of the wings of Yah, the Holy One of Israel. While Jesus and his armies are destroying the beast kingdom. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him, the Assyrian, the final Antichrist, like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. So here's two chapters in Isaiah, <coughs> excuse me, back to back, 
talking about the return of Jesus at the end of the age and the things that will be taught during the early days of the millennium. And so many Bible scholars have gotten all of these chapters wrong in Isaiah and think this is all about past history and King Sennacherib. No, brothers and sisters, this is the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the age and the establishment of his kingdom. Once you realize that's what the book of Isaiah is talking about from front to back, you can't put it down. You can't put it down. Again, if you read Micah 5, it's talking about the return of Jesus and his adversary is called in Assyria. If you read Isaiah 14, it's all about the return of Jesus when he puts Satan in handcuffs. And it says that Jesus' adversary, you know, I'm paraphrasing it, you need to read it, is the Assyrian. Isaiah 14. All right, so you need to realize that when you're reading about the Assyrian in the book of Isaiah, it's about the final Antichrist, not about the Assyrian coming against the northern ten tribes centuries ago. Oh, it, there's past fulfillments of prophecy and future fulfillments of prophecy, but you need to understand the story that Father is trying to tell the last generation the unlocking of the understanding of these passages. But you just had two chapters back to back about the return of Christ at the end of the age and how he's going to defeat the final Antichrist, the Assyrian, like as in the day of Midian, the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. Again, if you don't know what that means, take your behinds back to Judges chapter 6 and 7. As his rod was on the sea. That's talking about how God the Father set his people free from Egypt and how he put his rod on the Red Sea and split it and let his people safely pass through it and then took the walls of water and, and brought them down and struck the Egyptian army. All right? So... So what that's representing is, is when Father decides that he's going to free his people, their, their time of chastisement is over, and it's now time to free them, what, whoever God used as a rod of anger to whip his people with, he breaks that rod when he's done using them. All right? So... Here, Father, in the Word of God, is using stories from Judges, using stories from Exodus, all right, and, and using dip multiple stories to paint a picture of what it's going to be like at the end of the age. Hallelujah. All right, that was Isaiah 9 and 10. Let's look at Zechariah 14, 5b through 7. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But at evening time it, it shall happen that it will be light. And that is the match to Isaiah 17, uh, verse 4, I believe. Let me double check that. Zechariah 14, 7 is Isaiah... 17, I think it's 14. Yes, I, Isaiah 17, 14 is Zechariah 14, 7. Is that cool or what? Points you right back to Zechariah 14. Then behold, at evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is no more, the wicked. This is the portion of those who plunder us during the time of Jacob's trouble, and the lot of those who rob us. Right? So, we're told the hour of the day, Jerusalem time, that Jesus will appear to begin this battle. I'm, I'm pausing, letting you think about that. So you can say, oh, turning this guy off. He obviously hasn't read all of uh, uh, the passages about no man know it the day or the hour. I hear you, brothers and sisters. I hear what you're saying. 
but I know what the Bible just said in Zechariah 14, uh, 7 and Isaiah 17, 14. And, and as we keep on with this study, you're going to see that I'm right. At evening time, twilight, it's not quite day, it's not quite night. That's when it shall be light, it shall happen. When the wicked shall receive its punishment by the one who sits to judge the living and the dead. And he comes to free the righteous of his people. You have to know. So what does it mean no man knoweth the day and no man knoweth the hour? Well, that's, once you know this, then I guess it's saying we don't know the, the year. We don't know the week. We don't know the exact day, the moment of our Lord's return. We don't. But I'm telling you, the Bible says we can know the hour of the day, Jerusalem time, that it shall happen, that it will be light. And if you say, well, I see what you're saying, brother. I'm just not sure. Okay, let's keep reading. Isaiah 14, verses 24 and 25. Back to Isaiah. Assyria destroyed the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. As I have purposed it, so it shall stand. This is part of the proclamations of Revelation 14. This is the part of the proclamations of the decree of Daniel 7, verses 25 through 27. All right, the warning of the kingdom to the saints of the Most High, who... By the end of the 42 months have just overcome Satan and they have cast him down because there is nothing he can do to cause them to betray Jesus, even if it means their life. That's how we defeat Satan. And we've already been told in advance that we win. And you might say, well, brother, it sounds like you're taking away from what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. No, I'm not. But I am reading the Word of God. I'm reading Daniel 7. I'm reading Revelation 12, 11. Okay, you need to read it too. It's part of Father's plan. This is what I have decreed, what I have sworn, what I have purposed. This is not only talking about bringing the curse upon his people at the end of the age and then causing all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth in Jeremiah 25 to drink of the cup of madness. But here we go in Isaiah 14, which is that chapter all about the end of the age and identifying who the, uh, the Antichrist is. Here it is in verse 25, that I will break the Assyrian in my land and on my mountains tread him underfoot. Revelation 19 sound familiar? Then his yoke shall be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulders. Israel is going to go into slavery one last time. Yes, the Antichrist is called the Assyrian. This Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal is called the Assyrian. He's not Roman. I'm sorry. All right, but he is the king of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Judges 7, verse 9, time to put it all together. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. All right, that represents what God the Father is going to say to Jesus at the seventh bowl. At the hour of the um, twilight, the twilight offering of the evening sacrifice is when this battle will begin. And when the winepress will be trampled around the wedding hall and up and down the Jordan Valley. All right. At evening time twilight, it shall happen that it shall be light. Hallelujah. So this story of Gideon represents Jesus being used by his father and, and what father is going to say, right? Judges 7. 
it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against, go down against, all right, the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. That's what Father is going to tell Jesus as, as he has Jesus sit to his right hand. And here they come on the cherub of Ezekiel chapter 1, above the wedding hall, coming from the third heaven to earth at the seventh bowl. Look at Judges 7 verses 24 and 25. Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim. This represents what's going to happen at the seventh trumpet. When the 42 months is over and Elijah and Moses have been seen ascending up into the clouds. <coughs> Excuse me. And an earthquake happens in Jerusalem at the seventh trumpet. And exactly 7,000 people are going to die. At that moment, the father pulls the strong delusion and sends his messengers, envoys, and ambassadors out to the nations. That's what this represents. Saying, come down. Remember, go down against come down against the Midianites and seize from them in battle, taking plunder and spoil, the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. Then all of the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan, and they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who again represents Jesus at his coming on the other side of the Jordan. So obviously, even though I only have, what, three verses of Judges 7 listed here, to get a full understanding of what is meant uh, in Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 10 about Jesus coming at the battle of the great day of God Almighty and raising and mustering his army for battle like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb as in the day of Midian. If you really want to get a good grasp of what's going on in the story of Gideon, my three verses that I have for you here is not enough. You need to go read all of Judges 6 and Judges 7 to see the full story of Gideon. But I'm hoping this short study whets your appetite, and now you understand that if you want to know what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back, all right, you need to match up Isaiah 9 and 10 with Judges 7. See, that's my goal, is to make you de have the desire to just go spend a couple hours in God's Word. That's why I do these short studies, and you will be blessed. And you'll have an understanding of the last days far and above all Bible scholars. Because Father reveals this level of understanding to the humble, contrite in spirit, to the least of the flock. But they tremble at his word. You know, 15 minutes of reading the word of God per day is not enough for those who tremble at his word. So if you're the meek, the mild, the humble, all right, the least of the flock who spend hours in the word of God every day, you're going to get understanding that, that prophets of old wish they had. Hallelujah. And you have access to search engines. Right? You have no excuse. So let's go ahead and end this short study, brothers and sisters. I hope this has been a blessing to you. All right? I hope now you just can't wait to get in Isaiah 9 and 10 and 14 and Zechariah 14. All right? And, and, and look up every single passage I have here about the good and bad invited guest, about the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And get a good understanding of what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back. The Redeemer of Israel. The Messiah of Israel. And you might say, brother, that sounds good, but I ain't hearing enough about the church of Jesus Christ. Okay, what do you think the church is? You become Israel on the day of your adoption. You become a member of the My Sanctified Armies of Heaven. 
you become refined Israel on the day of your adoption. If you've been taught something different than that, brothers and sisters, you you may want to go help your shepherd out. Hallelujah. All right. Well, brothers and sisters, I can't wait to see you again. And until next time, God bless.